<laughs> All righty. All right, guys. Uh, today we're going to talk about D-Day. Uh, D-Day is one of the most important dates in not just American history, but in world history. Okay. So if we're going to talk about D-Day, we should probably figure out what in the world D-Day means. Like, what does the D in D-Day mean? Delivery day? <laughs> Deliverance day? No. What? Deployment day? No, good guess. Destruction day? No, good guess. None of you guys heard this before, huh? Okay, well, let me tell you what it is. Dating back to the War of 1812, in American military history, D-Day signifies the day of the attack. H-hour would mean the hour of the attack. Now, this is, we have had literally thousands of D-Days in American military history. This just happens to be the D-Day of all D-Days. So it became known simply as D-Day. So D-Day is... June 6, 1944. Now, I can talk about D-Day in this way. I can say D minus 7, which means seven days before the attack. I can say D plus 7 to figure out what we have accomplished in the seven days since the day of the attack. Does that make sense? H hour is going to be roughly 7 a.m. on June 6, 1944, okay? So it's a nickname that sticks, okay? Now, the American people knew, the German people knew, the French people knew, the British people knew that at some point this was going to happen. Now, it has been four years since the miracle of Dunkirk. And the Germans have had four years to prepare for this day. And we have had four years to prepare for this day. Everybody knew it was going to come. We just didn't know exactly when. <coughs> so when that day did come, the time zones, the way they set up, okay? Right now in England, how many hours ahead of they, of, of, are they of us? Six hours ahead of us, how many hours ahead of the East Coast? Five? Okay. Five? Okay. So while this is underway, the American people start to hear about it in the morning. President Roosevelt will address the nation, and millions of Americans across the United States will go to church that day to pray for our troops on this day, okay? The world knew that this was going to be, whoever won this battle could turn out to be the victor in World War II, okay? Now by June of 44, guys, June 6, we had just taken Rome. We are winning. The Russians are starting to turn back the Germans in the Soviet Union. Okay, so we are winning. Okay, but it's not over. So we are going to have to cross the English Channel. Now, the operation of this, the operation code name is Operation Overlord. Okay, any of you guys see that movie that came out a couple of years called Overlord? Okay. It was a zombie like type movie, Nazi zombie movie. Okay, it's not very good. I did watch it though. The first 10 minutes of the movie are pretty good until the paratroopers start landing and you start to see these Nazi, so like German scientists create, you know, you guys know Frankenstein, the story of Frankenstein, right? Yeah. So they create these zombie soldiers, the Germans, the Nazis did, okay? And so the movie's about when our troops land in Normandy, 
they're fighting these <laughs> Nazi zombies. Huh. Yeah. It's not very good. So, in charge of this operation, of course, we've talked about General Dwight David Eisenhower, Supreme Allied Commander, and what the Germans will be building across uh, the coastline of France is called the Atlantic Wall. Now, we had been bombing, and we know that because we did the air war uh, yesterday. Okay. Let me see. I have some maps I want to show you guys. Okay. I was kind of rushed here. Let's see if I can... Okay. No. Oh, I know which one I'm looking for. I got it right here, folks. Okay. The Atlantic Wall. Okay. So, this is kind of the cool part of the story. All right. So, this squiggly line is the Atlantic Wall, the German defenses along the coast. Okay. Now, you see these squares. These are like super fortresses. The triangles are secondary fortresses, okay? Now, in charge of this operation will be both uh, uh, General Rundstedt of the Germans and General Erwin Rommel, who will also be in Normandy. Now, Normandy is a region of France, not a city, okay? Up here, this is called Pas de Calais. This is a region of France. Across Calais is Dover. Okay, the narrowest point between the continent and the island is 20 miles. So on a clear day, you can look from the coast of France across the English Channel, okay, to uh, see the white cliffs of England on a clear day, 20 miles. And people have swam across this. I think I told you guys. Uh, Bryn, her aunt, Bryn Murphy. Her aunt has swum this, swam across this channel. She's one of very few people that have ever done that. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, anyhow, so guys, where's the easiest place to cross? The Dover Strait. Yes? 20 miles. You're putting literally hundreds of thousands of men on landing craft. So we're going to try and make the Germans believe that we are going to cross here. But in actuality, we're going to cross here, which is a much more treacherous journey for our troops. Okay? So I will talk about that. Okay, one thing I forgot to mention to you guys. I, I, I remember telling you that Patton's going to lose the first army. He gets in trouble. So remember when I was telling you about Daniel Inouye and Bob Dole in the hospital? Okay? Well, guys, while we were in Italy, General Patton went to a military hospital, and he was pinning purple hearts on soldiers that had been wounded. Some of these guys are wounded really bad and are going to die. It's a somber occasion, a general coming to do this. There's doctors and nurses there. The media is there. They're watching this. Patton is you know, coming up to these soldiers, whispering in their ears, you know, some of them are conscious, some of them are not, and pinning the purple heart on them, okay? He gets to the end of this ward. It's a long tent. And there's a soldier sitting on the end of the bed, in uniform, not wounded. He's got his head in his hands, buried in his hands, and he's kind of weeping, this young man. And Patton gets down to this kid, and he goes... He looks at him, and he goes, what's wrong with you? And the kid looks up, sobbing at the general, and says, sir, I just can't take it anymore. And he goes, Patton goes, what do you mean you can't take it anymore? Look at these guys. These guys can't take it anymore. You're not wounded. And Patton's carrying these leather gloves in his hand. And he smacks this kid upside the head. And there's a gasp in the room. Like, you know, nurses, doctors, the media is there. Obviously, guys, this kid has post-traumatic stress, right? He's got shell shock, which is a term they used to use. 
Okay. The kid is shaking. And Patton just starts berating him. Says, you're going back to the front lines now. Well, guys, the government controlled the media during World War II. Okay. The word is going to slip out about this. And Eisenhower feels like he needs to punish Patton. This soldier's mother does hear about it. And she's upset. And so Eisenhower's got a public relations problem in Patton. And this isn't Patton's first time he got in trouble, okay? He doesn't like taking orders from Monty. He's a pain in the ass, but he's a good soldier. So Patton takes away his army instead of firing, okay? So Patton has some time on his hands. So they send Patton to Dover. It's published in all the newspapers. Patton arrives in Dover. So the Germans are thinking, if this is where Patton is, this is where the attack's going to be. And they make sure there's pictures of Patton next to landmarks that the Germans would see in the newspapers, like, oh, he's definitely in Dover. Okay? But that's just the beginning of it. We've got to try and fool the Germans here. Okay? Now, before I get into more of that, let me talk about this Atlantic Wall that you're going to see. Now, I asked you the other day, how many guys have seen Saving Private Ryan? Okay, good. Because, guys, before it's all said and done, we're going to watch the first 30 minutes of this movie. Okay? And those of you guys that have seen it know what I'm talking about. It's very realistic. Okay? Um, and what you see on those beaches when we watch the movie is the Atlantic Wall, okay? So this is a picture from the shoreline looking out, okay? And so at high tide, this stuff is all underwater. At low tide, it's exposed, okay? So what is underwater? Belgian gates. So we're gonna be using flat bottom boats to go in, okay? These boats come from the swamps of Louisiana. So when I went to the World War II Museum in Nolens, okay, it used to be called the D-Day Museum, okay, because they built these boats in Louisiana. A guy named Higgins built the swamp boats. And so when we got in the war, we needed somebody to build these boats for, for the troops. And so they went to the guy in Louisiana and said, hey, we need you to build boats. So they called them Higgins boats, okay, and they built Thousands of them. Now, when they went to do the museum, guys, here, I'll show you a picture of these boats. This is a Higgins boat. Okay. This, like this. Okay. They're flat bottom, then they have a gate that comes out. Okay. They can go right up onto the beach. Okay. These are guys practicing. Okay. So, These flat bottom boats are going to come in. If you hit this Belgian gate, okay, the boat's going to stop. The soldier's going to have to jump out. Most of them have, at a minimum, 60 pounds of weight on their backs. Okay? They're going to drown. Okay? Then you have these log posts with mines. Now, these mines are not attached. So, like, if your boat hits one of these log posts, that mine's going to fall off and explode, okay? And then log ramps. So you, you hit this ramp, the mines are on there, boom. And then these hedgehogs that you'll see in the movie, okay? And then, guys, there's a cliff. Now, this is a steeper cliff. At some parts of the beach, there's high cliffs. At other parts, there's a gradual cliff, okay? So we're going to try and pick locations where there's a gradual cliff, not a high cliff, okay? So, if you go at low tide, all of this stuff is exposed on the beach. So, the Germans know there's a good chance the Americans will come during low tide. When is low tide? When you have a what? But what time of the month is the lowest tide? Isn't it a full moon? 
Maybe right after a full moon? It's definitely affected by the moon. I guess. Okay, here I go again. Okay. You guys are supposed to know this stuff. You're smarter than I am. You did explain it to me. I got it. I talked the fourth hour about it, and they filled me in. What's up with the tides, ladies? Yeah, well, I could have told you that. So, I think it's full moon. I think it's full moon. Somebody Google it. What time of month do you get the low, lowest time? The moon and the tides. Whatever you want to Google. Okay. okay. So, but here's the thing, guys. When you go in at low tide, you have three to 400 more yards that you're going to have to cross. Yeah. Go in the middle. Okay. So the Germans have an idea. Okay. They know too. I mean, they're not stupid like me. Okay. So they know when the full, when the tide is going to be low. Okay. So they know when to be on higher alert. But it does create more beach to cross because the Germans are going to be firing on our guys. Okay. But they're at least going to be able to get to the beach during low tide. You with me? Okay. So the Atlantic wall. These are the hedgehogs. You can see the, the Higgins boats in the background. Now, this is at Arrow Mansions, okay? That day, one of the problems with choosing Normandy, there's not a good port to bring in big ships and offload equipment. So they're going to build their own that day, okay? So you see these big concrete blocks? They're going to pull these across the English Channel and sink them out here, okay? They're actually going to put ships in here. They're going, any guys water ski? You want it, water ski when? Glassy water, right? Which is usually in the morning. Best time to ski is in the morning or as the sun's going down, right? So. We're going to try and create glassy water in here, okay? So they're dropping these in to try and stop the current, okay? And then these are pontoon docks. So you create glassy water here, you bring your ships in, okay? Bring your ships in, bring them in, and you got floating docks to unload tanks, equipment, all that other stuff. They build a port. So if you go to Aeromanches today, guys, you can still see this stuff out in the channel at Arrow Mansions. Okay, it's still sitting out there. It's 80 years later, okay? All right, there's going to be five beaches that we're going to land on. Okay, how many? Five. How many? Five. What are their names? Okay, these are the two Americans. These are named after Native American names, okay? Utah and Omaha, okay? You'll see those two here. When we watch the movie, guys, it's Omaha Beach. Okay. Gold, Juno, and Sword will be a combined British, Canadian, Scottish uh, troops coming in. Okay. At the Atlantic Wall. Utah, Omaha, Omaha Gold, Juno, and Sword. I'll tell you what happens at all these beaches. So another picture, okay, I need to come back to this, okay, let me come back to that in a minute, go back to the other slideshow. Okay, you guys good on this? Now, guys, we can also count on the French resistance, okay, the French that hate the Germans are helping us. There's a lot of good movies on like spies and stuff, you know, French spies helping us, British spies going into France. And there's Americans going in, all kinds of good stories on this. But anyhow, the French resistance, okay, we are in communication with 
via radio. And so over the radio, we are sending coded messages all 24 hours a day, code, coded messages. You turn on the radio, you can hear a Brit talking on the radio in France, okay? They're waiting for one phrase to know when the invasion is coming. That phrase, anybody know it? Jean has a long mustache. Jean has a long mustache. That's to let the French know the invasion is coming that morning. Okay? And what the French resistance is going to do is they're going to light our landing zones because we're going to be dropping in paratroopers in the early morning hours, cover of darkness. They need to know where to land. Okay, so they're going to light landing zones. Two, they're going to uh, blow up railroad tracks because the Germans are going to have to send reinforcements to the coast. Okay, if we destroy the railroads, they're going to have to find a different way than train cars to get them there. And telegraph lines, cutting phone lines, telegraph lines. Okay, so the Germans at the beach, at the coast, can't radio back. So that's the job of the French resistance, all right? Now, have any of you guys ever seen a movie called Red Dawn? The original Red Dawn. You should be showing us these oh, I was teaching movies in history, we would watch Red Dawn, which was made in the 1980s, okay? It was about the communist invasion of the United States in the 1980s led by the Cubans and the Soviets, okay? It's freaking awesome. When it was made in the 80s, it was given the first movie ever given the rating PG-13. And it was the, first, the movie with the most acts of violence per minute of a movie in history. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. It's, it's a war movie. So anyhow, in this movie, you go back and watch it, Racy. Okay, there's a part where they capture an American pilot. This is these young young people that are fighting against the communists. Capture an American pilot, and they're suspicious of him. And he's trying to tell them, "Look, guys, I'm with you. We're fighting. We're fighting against the communists." And they're listening to the radio, and you hear that term in the movie. John has a long mustache in the movie, and only people that know this. Would know the reference in the movie. Okay. So, every June 6, 1944, I get an email or a Facebook message from Coach Lawborn with the phrase, Jean has a long mustache. Okay. Why did they get that one? Huh? That was so crazy. It's just the one that you. <laughs> okay. Too much information? Quite possibly. <laughs> okay. Operation Fortitude. So they send Patton to Dover, right? Well, guys, they got to make the Germans think this is where the invasion is. So they're going to build a fake army there. This tank is inflatable. It's fake. This artillery is made out of plywood. They're going to build an entire fake army at Dover. They will go so far, guys, as to take a recently deceased soldier, freeze the body, change the clothes, and play, place fake intelligence, fake maps of the invasion on the body of the individual, and then release the body where the Germans will find it. They go through the clothing of this soldier, they pull out maps, and they're like, holy crap, we found the maps of the invasion at Dover. Okay, this was huge operation fortitude. Okay, it's all fake. Guys, it works. All we need is a few hours for it to work, just for a few hours, okay, to stop the reinforcements from getting in and throwing us back into the sea. We need time to establish a beachhead that day, and we will, okay. In large part, to Operation Fortitude. Okay. So, the 
if you ever want to watch a movie about D-Day, this is the one to watch. Okay? It is the longest movie. It's a little over three hours. Okay? Um, it doesn't really have a plot or character development. But as you can see, John Wayne, the no. Duke, is in it. Okay? Henry Fonda and Robert Mitchell. All great actors. Okay? That don't do great acting in this movie. Okay? But... They give you the German perspective, the French perspective, the British perspective, and the American perspective. Okay. Now, okay. we haven't launched the invasion yet. Okay. We've got Operation Fortitude. Okay. Now. Remember when we talked about the Battle of Britain? I had way too much information for you. Here we go again. Okay. Now, guys, by June of 44, we have 3 million Allied troops on the island of Britain. Most of them are American GIs. About 2 million Americans on the island. What's GI stand for? Okay. Oh, what does GI stand for? Anyone? GI Joe? I'll tell you a story how G.I. Joe broke up my family, but Whoa, wait a that would be too much information one day, in one day. I don't. I, I would rather do that than never to say my GA. Government issue. Guys, you join the military, Uncle Sam owns you. You are now government issue. Now, yeah, Joe. Uh, did you guys hear about the really bad tornado in Mississippi about two weeks ago? It hit the town of Rolling Fork, Mississippi. That is my mother's hometown. She was born in 1940 in Rolling Fork, and my mother was born poor. When I say poor, I mean dirt poor. They had a cow. They had a deer. They had a dog, and my my grandmother married three times. Uh, her first two husbands died, and uh, so my mom was the daughter of the second husband. Happy, his name was Happy. Okay. Oh, happy. <laughs> he died. Um, he was a power, like a pole, a power line worker. Got like. So, when my mom died, we went back to Rolling Fork to, you know, close up Grandma's house. So, I got to see how poor, how poor that town was. Rolling Fork is a very, like, poor town okay, in the Mississippi. It's Mississippi's a poor state, probably the poorest state in the Union. Okay. Anyhow, my mom had one brother, Jake, and Jake was married. So we get back to Grandma's house. There's some furniture. There's a little bit of jewelry. There's my grandma's web wedding ring. Well, Jake's wife saw Grandma's wedding ring, and she wanted it. My mom wanted it. Well, I'm like six. I'm seven years old. My sister's nine. I'm bored. I'm, you know, I'm being a pain in the ass, I'm sure. And so she goes to Kmart. You guys know what Kmart is? It's like a Walmart, right? There's, there's, yeah. One day, kids won't know what Kmart was. But anyhow, she goes to Kmart and buys me a G.I. Joe. Well, Jake has two sons. My mom didn't buy a G.I. Joe for them. So my mom, her sister-in-law, get in a fight, argument, never saw him again until my mom's funeral. Haven't seen him since. G.I. Joe. Could have stole your G.I. Joe for I'm guessing. Well, he didn't steal it. She, they were just mad that we, she didn't get one for them. Oh, wait. Really? Yeah. I'm just straight up. You didn't buy my She's child. that woman. She's that woman. Oh, okay. Wow. Now, you know, through you know. Facebook, I've reached out. 
to my cousins. Oh, there's no family. Oh, now, shut up, it's boy. not their fault that their mom. This <laughs> <laughs> making you look good. So they, uh, yeah, they. One of them lives in Mississippi still, and uh, they went to Mississippi State, and they got kids in college now, like I do. And so I stay. I keep up with one of them, and uh, I tried to get in touch with my uncle. Never heard anything back. G.I. Joe. Thanks for asking. Whoever asked what G.I. stands for. Okay. Now, back to the G.I.s in Britain, right? Two million Americans in Britain. Now, you talk about American tourists in Europe, right? How do those people in Europe view us? Yeah, yeah, at the time, but still, Americans are cocky. We're brash. They think of us as cowboys. I mean, like, there's literally people in Italy that think everybody in America is a cowboy. Okay? <laughs> um, because all the Westerns, guys, all those movies that they would show in Europe, are like all these Westerns, John Wayne, you know what I mean? Like, Western. Um, so, the thing about having two million GIs in Britain training for this day, okay, is going to have an impact on British society. The British girls, the British women, they like these Americans, which did not endear the American men to the British men. You understand? So my first year teaching, guys, I had this student. Her name is uh, Valerie Emming. She's a pharmacist now. Um, she brought this poem and gave it to me in this sheet, and I've had it every ever since, and I've read it to my students every year when talking about D-Day. This is the buildup. Now, guys, all the troops, all the medical supplies, all the ammunition, all the tanks, all the planes for a huge army, Eisenhower quipped that only the great number of barrage balloons floating in the skies above the island kept it from sinking into the sea. Isn't that funny? Okay. So, this poem, how much time do I have? I got time? Okay. It's called A British Girl's Lament. Okay, you guys know the word lament? Is that one of your vocab words? Like a British girl's sorrow. All right? Now, before I talk about this, or read this, okay, Americans, brash, cocky. How many guys are chewing gum right now? I, okay, guys, Amer we used to chew gum a lot in this country, okay? and I, I think we still do. I, I don't. There used to be more gum chewing in this school when you couldn't do it, when you'd get a demerit for it. Yeah, no. Now that you can do it, not as many people chew gum, okay? But anyhow, they like to chew gum, okay? We're cocky. We like to have fun. Okay, these are 18 to 21-year-old guys. You know what I mean? So... <laughs> There's, there's a couple references. They call us Yankees, right? We're the Yanks. Yes? Yankees? Yep. Um, now, there's references in this poem to the Huns. The Huns, guys, are the Germans. Okay? There's references to um, a woman named Hetty Lamarck. Hedy Lamar is a beautiful sex symbol actress like Marilyn Monroe back then. Okay. Um, what else? There's one cuss word. I'm sorry. Comes in the first stanza. That's fine. Um, you know the British like to drink tea, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, we like beer. Right. Not sure about Bud Light, but we like beer, right? Thank you. Anybody else catch the reference? Thank you. Bud Light's just water burning with beer. Okay. <laughs> As is Coors Light and Miller Light. Okay. Um, Bush Light, yeah. Keystone. yeah, no. Okay. Um, no, I, but you caught my reference. I got it. About the whole yeah, Bud yeah, Light yeah. thing. <laughs> the 
and so sexual so. woman. Yes. And oh, you know, what? Okay, so Bud Light made like short version of Bud Light made like the commercial that they advertised with this one uh, trans person, and I had a lot of people like encouraging me to wait, wait out their dreams. <laughs> and I tried to switch to Coors Light. The funny thing about Coors Light, they is support also LGBT too. Yes, yeah. They have to. And then, did you see the Kid Rock video? Uh -uh. Oh, you gotta see the Kid Rock video. Shot the Bud Light. He gets out a freaking machine gun and he's got <laughs> 30 packs of Bud Light. <laughs> Says some words into the camera and then turns around and he's like, pop, 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 pop. Okay. Yeah, hey, it's hey, it's hey, freaking hey, toxic hey, masculinity hey, at the max. Okay. Yeah. yeah, guys, you know, I. We're gonna have to figure this thing out somehow, okay? All right, listen. So uh, let me read this to you. It's it's a little cheesy, okay? But as poetry can be. All right. Now these troops, these American troops, rookie, these GIs, they have not fought yet. They have not seen combat. Most of them are just they've crossed the sea, okay? Dear old England's not the same. We dreaded the invasion. Well, it came. But no, it's not the beastly Hun. It's the goddamn Yankee Army's come. You see them in the train and bus. There isn't room for lots of us. We walk to let them have our seats, then get run over by their jeeps. They moan about our lukewarm beer, think beer's like water over here. But after drinking one or more, you'll find them stretched out on the floor. You should see them try to dance. They find a partner, start to prance. When you're half dead, they stop and smile and say, how about that, honey child? Then you see them try to jitterbug. They twist and turn and pull and tug. It's enough to make red Indians jealous, yet they are civilized, or so they tell us. With admiration, we would stare at the ribbons that they wear and think of deeds so bold and daring that won the ribbons they are wearing. Alas, they haven't fought the Hun. No War battles have they won. Those pretty ribbons just denotes they've crossed the sea, brave men in boats. We speak to them, they look hazy. We think they're daft, they think we're crazy. Yet they are our allies, we must be nice. They love us so, but cats like mice. They laugh at us for drinking tea. Yet a finer, funnier sight you'll never see than a yank chewing gum with a dumb-looking face, they'll raise a laugh, most any place. They think that they can shoot and fight. It's true they fight, yes, when they're tight. I must admit their shooting's fine. They sure can shoot a damn good line, you know, like a pickup line. They'll tell you that you've teeth like pearls. They love your hair, the way it curls. Your eyes could dim the brightest star. Your competition for Eddie Lamar. You are their life, their love, their all. And for no other would they fall. They'll love you dear until death do part. And if you leave, you'll break their heart. And then they leave you broken hearted. The camp is moved. Your love departed. You wait for mail that doesn't come. And then you realize you're awfully dumb. In a different town, in a different place, to a different girl with a different face. I love you, darling. Please be mine. Same old yank, same old line. A British girl's lament. Okay. Now, one of the unique things about the United States of America, please stop the laughing. Okay. One of the unique things about our country, guys, is that we have military bases all over the world. Yes? And where we have military bases, our soldiers and sailors intermingle with the local population. Yes? I grew up in Pensacola, Florida, in a Navy town. Okay? And there were more than a few Navy sailors that met wives overseas in places like the Philippines. One of my best friends in high school, Billy Selby, his mother is Filipina. Okay. Uh, this happened with Vietnamese women as well from the Vietnam War era. 
okay? Um, it's even happened in the Middle East. Now, they didn't really promote this in the Middle East because of the whole religious thing, right? But it happens. If you are, if you are, uh, a, you, know, you post a guard in, in Iraq, in a city, in Baghdad, and the same woman walks by your post every day, you know, to and from wherever she's going, and you're friendly, and she's friendly, and you get talking. Guys, love happens, okay? And so there's been a lot of marriages from American military personnel from all over the world, okay? And no different in Britain in World War II. So a lot of those men went back after the war to find their girlfriends, you know, and married them. Some of them even stayed in England after the war, okay? So it's the societal impact of 2 million GIs living for six months or so, even longer on certain bases, um, years, uh, is, well, well documented, okay? All right, so back to this. Now, a couple things. I'm going to open up another slideshow here. Okay. Um, okay. So, guys, we are going to bomb and try and weaken up the Atlantic Wall. Now, we can't just bomb in Normandy. Because the Germans will know that's where we're going to land. So we have to bomb up and down the coast, okay? So they think we're coming here, but we're going to come here, okay? Now, this is Omaha Beach. I took this picture in June of 1999, okay? And it was fairly low tide that day. And I walked out as far as I could without getting my one pair of shoes wet. My high tops, okay? Looking back. Okay, that is Omaha Beach right there. Okay. This is down the beach a little bit. Uh, this is Pont du Hoc, okay? You see the high cliffs over here, okay? I know you're focused on me standing in this bomb crater right here, okay? But these bomb craters are still there 70, 80 years later. Okay, you can go there and see this, okay? So we're going to bomb that area heavily. Here's more of Operation Fortitude, okay? Now, these are some of the paratroopers, and then the British are going to use gliders. You guys know what a glider is? It's a plane without a motor. You take it up in the air, you pull it behind a plane, and then you unhook it, and it just glides. Now, they're going to actually put troops on these gliders, and they're going to land them behind enemy lines at night. Sounds crazy. It is. Okay. The paratroopers that land, you got the 101st and the 82nd Airborne. Okay. And uh, Grace, you know about this, right? The 101st, right? And so uh, they're going to land, and the thing they're going to do, guys, is they're trying to secure key bridges, like this Pegasus Bridge. See, the Germans have attach explosives to all these bridges. Because if the attack comes, they want to be able to control the bridges. And if the Americans get off the beach, they want to be able to blow the bridges so we get stuck. We want to capture these bridges so that if the invasion fails, we can blow the bridges and prevent them from throwing us into the sea. So that's got to come the very early morning hours of June 6th. The paratroopers and gliders will be sent in to secure these bridges. And it's going to be freaking chaos, guys. The weather's bad. The drops are all wrong. Guys are scattered all over the place. Okay? But they will secure these bridges and have to wait and hold out for reinforcements later in the day. And that's what you see in the movie Saving Private Ryan. Okay, in the end, that's what you're going to see. Okay, if you watch the whole movie. Okay. Now, I want to show you this. This is Pont du Hoc. This is further down the beach towards Utah Beach. Okay, the cliffs are high here. Now, we believe at the time 
there was a large gun encampment down at Pont du Hoc. And it, we thought that they could use that gun to fire down the beaches and kill our men. So the Army Rangers were tasked with scaling these cliffs to take out this gun. They call them Rudder's Rangers. Now this is looking out at Pont du Hoc. There's a big cliff here. Okay, this is inside a bunker. Okay. There's my wife looking at the bunker. Okay. Yeah, I know I'm down to 5%. Okay. All right, this is uh, this is American Cemetery. Okay. I talked about the one in Italy. Okay. Uh, this one here, Buford Spugel. Spung, Spungle. Okay. Uh, I believe this one's from Kansas. I can't read. Yeah, he's from Kansas. Okay. Uh, died in May 7th, 1944. Okay. July 7th, 1944. Okay. So D plus four weeks in a day. Okay. Okay. Let me. Okay. This is Aromanches, where they built the floating harbor. My high top tennis shoes. Okay. Your typical American tourist right there. Good yep. That's us crossing the channel. We took a ferry across. It took about six hours. Okay. Sorry. That's, let me find the other slideshow here. Okay. So, guys, this is where we're going to drop the paratroopers. Over here. Okay. Here's Pope Du Hawk, the, the high cliffs. It's Omaha Beach, okay, Utah Beach. Now, we drop these guys in under the cover of darkness to secure this bridge here, okay? And these are swamp areas. The Germans flooded these areas. So we got guys falling into the swamps, okay? It's total chaos. We got troops falling right into this town, San Mary Glees. Uh, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, guys. There's a fire in the city casino in San Mary Glees. So every, the townspeople are all trying to put this fire out. And the German troops are there, too. And all of a sudden, out of the sky come American paratroopers falling out of the sky in the middle of the night. Okay? Um, there's one guy that, like, landed on the church steeple, and his parachute got caught. And the bells are going off. And German guy shot him right through the foot. And he played dead for, like, six hours. Okay? While the bells are going off in his ear. Okay? Um, the guy was half deaf, but he lived. Okay. Yeah. Um, so guys, this is going to be the worst beach of all. Okay. Right here. Um, I know I'm at 5%. Okay. Um, everybody's going to like, Oh, Hey, there's paratroopers here. Maybe we should, uh, okay. Yeah. I want to show you this picture. Of, did I have the one of Rupert? So we tried to we tried to mess with them. Um, here, this is a fake dummy parachute. It's about four feet tall. Okay, so what the British just they dropped these behind the Germans. So our troops were landing here. They dropped them behind that to try to throw the Germans off. Now when this thing hits the ground, there's fireworks in this pack right here. So the arms drop with the impact of hitting the earth. And it starts popping like gunfire. Pop, 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 pop to throw the Germans off. Okay, well, they figured out, guys, it was a diversion, right? But they're trying anything to kind of fool the Germans on this, okay? Um, so that's in the museum. They call him Rupert, all right? So let me go back to um, just the notes, notes. And we're about out of time. Yeah. Okay, so when we get back on Tuesday, guys, um, I'll go through the timeline with you. You've got all the background on it, okay? And we'll, we'll go through the timeline. D-Day, D plus 1, D plus 7, D plus 30, and onward through France, okay? Or as our troops would say, cross the hedgerows of France.